the cross of Jesus stood his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clophis, and Mary of Magdala, seeing his mother and the disciple he loved standing near her. Jesus said, Woman, this is your son. And to the disciple, this is your mother. And from that moment, the disciple made a place for her in his home. After this, knowing that everything had now been completed and to fulfill the scripture perfectly, Jesus said, I thirst. I thirst. There was a jar of vinegar there. So they took a sponge and soaked it in the vinegar and put it on a hyssop stick and held it up to his mouth. After Jesus had taken the vinegar, said, it is accomplished, and bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. John's Gospel reaches its dramatic conclusion with Jesus' death on the cross. There are two details in particular in John's account that I want to call your attention to. The first is that Jesus bestows the care of his mother to John, the beloved disciple. But John doesn't call himself by name, even though it's his Gospel account. He calls himself the beloved disciple. Is that simply humility on his part? Perhaps. But John's Gospel is so rich with symbolism. Most scholars believe that there's a deeper symbolic truth here that points to each one of us as the beloved disciple. The beloved disciple is not just John who lived thousands of years ago. The beloved disciple is each one of us who say yes to Jesus who invite him to reign on the throne of our hearts. And so what does Jesus do in the final moments of his life but give his mother to his beloved disciple? Again, on the literal level, it's Mary having lost her husband and now about to lose her son. As a widow in that society where there would be no social network, Jesus, as a dutiful son, is looking out for his mother, saying, John, take care of her. But on the symbolic level, he's giving his mother to each one of us, saying, welcome her into your home. Welcome her into your heart. Many saints have written on the beauty of coming to know Jesus through dedicating ourselves to his mother. St. Louis de Montfort has written a total consecration to Mary. That was extremely influential for young Carol Votia, the future Pope John Paul II. Many great saints have written and have dedicated themselves to the Blessed Mother as a way of coming to know Jesus. Because think about it, who knows Jesus 
better than his mother? Who spent more time with Jesus? Is there anyone who spent more time with Jesus than his mother? And so to come to, to Jesus through Mary is perhaps the surest and the best way of coming to be a beloved disciple. That's detail num number one. Detail number two is that as Jesus hangs on the cross, he says, I thirst. Again, there's a literal level and there's a symbolic or mystical level to that. The literal level is quite obvious. Jesus is parched. He's been in the hot sun. He's been carrying a, a cross. He's been in a jail throughout the night. He's had an, a, an evening of agony in the garden where his sweat became like blood. He is parched. And so he asks for something to drink. The symbolic level, however, is much more profound and much more symbolic. Jesus is fulfilling the, the scriptures there. And as Mother Teresa pointed out, Jesus is thirsting for souls. Jesus is thirsting for each one of us to come to him. So profound was that awareness for Mother Teresa that in all of the convents of the missionaries of charity, Mother Teresa's order around the world, right next to the crucifix are the words, I thirst. That isn't an accident. Mother Teresa had a mystical experience and she saw a beggar in a railway station in Calcutta saying, I thirst. And through this mystical experience, she saw in that beggar the person of Jesus. Jesus in the distressing disguise of the poor. For Jesus doesn't simply thirst 2,000 years ago. He is thirsting today. He's thirsting in the distressing disguise of the poor and the hungry. He's asking us to reach out to them, to make a difference in this world, to reach out to the poor, to the needy, to the neglected, to those who are hungering, to those who are physically hungering, to those who are physically thirsting for us to make a difference. And he's saying to each one of us, I thirst for your soul. Come to me, surrender to me, allow me to be your Messiah. Allow me to be your Lord. Bring me your sins. Bring me your suffering. And when you do that, you give me the joy of being able to be your Messiah and Lord. Two profound truths in this section of John's Gospel. Jesus, shortly before he dies, giving us his mother. Jesus saying to each one of us, I thirst. The story now continues. It was the day of preparation. And to prevent the bodies remaining on the cross during that Sabbath, because that Sabbath was a day of special solemnity, the Jews came to Pilate and requested permission to have the legs of the prisoners broken and the bodies removed. So the soldiers came and they broke the legs of one of the men crucified with Jesus. And then of the other. But when they came to Jesus, they found he was already dead. So one of the soldiers, instead of breaking his legs, pierced his side with a lance. Immediately there came out blood and water. This is the testimony of one who saw it. Trustworthy testimony. And he knows he speaks the truth. And he speaks it so that you may believe as well. For all this happened to fulfill the word of Scripture. Not one bone of his will be broken. And again, in another place, Scripture records, they will look on him whom they have pierced. After this, 
Joseph of Arimathea, a disciple of Jesus, though a secret one for fear of the Jewish people, came to Pilate and requested permission to remove the body of Jesus. Pilate gave permission. So they came and removed his body. <laughs> <laughs> Nicodemus came as well. The one who had first come to Jesus by night time. And Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about a hundred pounds. They wrapped the body of Jesus with the spices and the linens, according to the Jewish burial custom. The place of Jesus' crucifixion. There was a garden, and in the garden a tomb in which no one had yet been buried, since it was the day of preparation, and the tomb was near at hand. They placed the body of Jesus there. The death of Jesus. Is it the beginning of the story or the end of the story? For us who believe, of course, it's the beginning of new life. Three details in the story that I would like to call your attention to. The first is that Jesus' side, literally his heart, is pierced with a lance. John recalls that the soldiers come and they break the legs of the prisoners. Why did they do that? Well, those who were crucified kept themselves alive by pushing themselves up and then they would catch a breath and then they would have to sink down. But in that sunken position, they wouldn't be able to get any breath into their lungs. And so they had to push themselves up and then they could breathe. When they were either too exhausted to push themselves up, as Jesus was, or when the soldiers came and broke their legs they, and they would no longer be able to push themselves up, then they would die from asphyxiation. So the soldiers come and they break the legs of one and of, of the other. But when they come to Jesus and they see that he's already dead, the soldier pierces his side. And what the detail that John includes is that out of his wounded side, literally out of his heart, flows blood and water. That's a medical condition that at the time of death, the pericardial fluid that surrounds the heart separates and so what flows out is what appears to be water and what appears to be blood. There's this separation. That's an actual medical detail. And it signified that indeed he had died. When Jesus appears to Sister Faustina and he asks her to have a, a portrait painted of him that would depict his divine mercy, that detail from John's Gospel is recalled. Out of Jesus' wounded heart flows this life-giving water stream of baptism and the blood of Holy Eucharist, the blood and the water that flow from the wounded heart of Jesus. We are washed clean 
In baptism, we are nourished and fed literally from the blood of the Lamb that is Jesus. These powerful details in John's Gospel. Number two, I call your attention to the presence of Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea, who are both named at this section of John's Gospel. Both of them were prominent Pharisees, members of the Jewish Leadership Council, the Sanhedrin. You recall earlier in John's Gospel, Nicodemus had come to Jesus by nighttime. In fact, John doesn't want you to miss that detail, and so he repeats it right here in the story. Nicodemus, who had first come to Jesus by nighttime, why did he come by nighttime? Because he didn't want anybody to see him. He didn't want to be seen in public with Jesus, so he sneaks in at nighttime because he's intrigued by Jesus. He's heard his words, he's seen some of his miracles, and he wants to find out more. And there's that famous section in John chapter 3, where Jesus says, God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten Son into the world, not to condemn the world, but that the world might be set free. Now, here it is. Jesus dies in the middle of the day. Traditionally, it's named as 3, three o'clock, so it's in the middle of the day in broad daylight. And now there's this transformation that has taken place in Nicodemus. He's not ashamed to be seen with, with Jesus. And he brings this huge mixture of myrrh and aloes. John recalls the detail weighing about 100 pounds. This, this would be very, very expensive ointment to quickly anoint the body of Jesus. And Joseph of Arimathea, another leading Jew, of the, t of the time. Again, not afraid to be seen with Jesus. In fact, he goes to Pontius Pilate and asks for the body of Jesus. How bold is that? Which, of course, gets the, the other high priests and all the members of the Sanhedrin all, all upset that Joseph would do such a bold deed and gives him his own burial tomb. What generosity, what holy boldness. Two men whose minds and whose hearts were opened to conversion, and they're not afraid to be seen with the likes of Jesus in this moment of his agony. Remember, Peter and James and the rest of the apostles are too ashamed to be seen with Jesus. Only the beloved disciple John, Mary of Magdala, Jesus' mother, and Mary, the wife of Josie, are there, these, these holy women and this, this one man, and these bold Pharisees who have experienced this conversion. I, I think that gives all of us hope. The last detail in the story that I want to point out is that Jesus is buried in a garden. The scriptures begin in the book of Genesis with the fall of Adam and Eve taking place in a garden. Here right next to the place where Jesus is crucified, there's a garden. It's there that Jesus will bring us the good news of the resurrection. It's there that John and Peter will discover the empty tomb, and it's there that Mary Magdala will become the disciple to the disciples and discover the joy of the resurrection. This is not the end of the story. This is only the beginning, and it continues in your life and mine. Amen. Amen. Since it was the day of preparation, and the tomb was near at hand. They brought the body of Jesus there.
If you were to travel to the Holy Land where Jesus lived and died, you may quickly discover what biblical archaeologists will tell you, that there are very few sacred sites that can be fully authenticated as the actual site where this biblical event occurred. But there are two such sites that they will say is truly the place of this event beyond any reasonable doubt. And those two places are Calvary, where Jesus died, and the garden where he was placed in that tomb. And as you heard from the gospel, John related near the place where he was crucified, there was a garden. In fact, it's even less than 100 feet apart. And they're contained in the same beautiful church of the Holy Sepulchre. Not long ago, Father Michael and I led a pilgrimage there, and we just lived across the street from the ancient city of Jerusalem, and I had the privilege every morning of rising early and going there to pray. Something drew me there, to want to just be at Calvary and imagine what it might have been like to have been there on Good Friday. What do you think? Can you even try to picture that in your mind's eye? And then to be led to that empty tomb where no one had been buried and placed in that garden. Isn't it interesting that it was a garden already suggesting a place of growth and new life? And at these two places, the most sacred sites in all the Christian world would be so close to each other isn't that just the way it is? It seems to me as I prayed there each day, I was trying to understand how we hold this Paschal mystery, this tension of the dying and the rising, the, the problems and the pain, but yet the growth that comes. And somehow they're so close to each other. They're such a part of our life, we can't, we can't ever escape those two forces and facts in our life. 